Strangeland is one of those games that tick all the right boxes for me. I've always loved point and click adventure games since those focus on telling a compelling story. The darker they get, the more they appeal to me. For example, one of my favorite point and click games is Sanitarium. Needless to say, Strangeland is dark, very dark. One look at the trailer or screenshot of the game is all it takes for you to know that this is no Monkey Island. But before I dive deeper into it, let's address the elephant in the room. The game does not support ultra wide in any shape or form. Normally I'd cut it some slack, but there's no reason to do so. It would have been a bit more work for them to make the environments larger so that they at least accommodate 21 by 9 Well, if you play in 1080p, you would just mean that each screen would be slightly larger and include a bit of scrolling as you traverse it. This is 2021 and there are no good excuses anymore. I'm holding smaller developers responsible too, since several tiny studios in the past have found ways to implement ultra-wide in their games. If there is a will, there is always a way and this is the case here as well. With that having been said, let's move on to the game's bread and butter, its story. We play as the Stranger, a character with no memory of how he ended up in Strangeland. My first thought when I saw him was, wow, Mirage from Apex Legends really let himself go. Shortly after having awoken in this horrific carnival, we see a woman commit suicide. The Stranger doesn't recognize her, but feels a strong desire to somehow save her life. The thing is, death works differently in Strangeland. Here it's simply not the final end of the journey. And just as the woman will keep coming back to life only to suffer and die again, so will our protagonist. This is where I would like to address the fact that death is not only a narrative tool here, but also a gameplay mechanic. In many cases we actually have to do things which will inevitably lead to the stranger's death in order to be able to progress. The player is taught early on that this is all part of the plan and encouraged to try different things without fear of failure. This is where I want to talk about the game's visuals. Personally, I don't like pixel art. I'm nearly 35 years old and to me pixel art is just an excuse to go the easy way instead of trying to make more advanced graphics. The days of DOS and old Sega and Nintendo games are in the past and to me this is where they should stay. I know many people will disagree but I also know that the vast majority of people will emphatically agree with me. How do I know this? Well simply look at the games that are being released by the big companies. They are almost exclusively with modern graphics. And incidentally those are also the games that sell the best. If you still disagree, fight me in the comment section. Anyway, the point that I was going to make before I got distracted was that Strangeland looks really nice and somehow even manages to appeal to me, someone who generally dislikes pixel art. That's not to say that it looks good all the time. Look at this segment here. It looks ugly, weirdly size and generally pretty bad but for the most part the game does appear to be really nice and somehow manages to create that feeling of a dark and confusing place without hope. The music on the other hand is mostly boring. The only track that I actually found to be really good is the one that you hear playing in the background of this video. Now let's talk about the game's voice acting. Since it's a low budget game I'd normally expect some pretty mediocre voice acting. To my surprise I couldn't have been more wrong. The actors deliver an excellent performance and there was never a moment when I felt like someone's voice doesn't fit. Not only is it great, but there's a surprisingly high amount of actual characters who do speak to you. However, while the voice acting is excellent, it can't make up for some bad and overcomplicated writing. Strangeland suffers from several serious problems, the main of which is the fact that it's a very short game. I was able to beat it within 3 hours without the use of a walkthrough. The game has a really well designed hint system where you can use a payphone to get a advice from a voice on the other end of the line. I found this especially original because it reminded me of the old days when people were actually calling helplines in order to get hints for adventure games. This is done really well here because it ties into the story. The voice talking to you sounds like an angry version of the stranger. It will even insult you if you need too many hints for the same puzzle, after which it will simply tell you the solution. But as I stated before, the game is too short and that leads to a variety of other problems. First of all, there are very few screens in total. It all takes place in a tight environment. This gives the player the feeling that the whole game is just happening within a span of a few hours. This feeling is reinforced by the fact that our protagonist does not really grow in any way during the whole ordeal. At first, I looked at the game and was reminded of Silent Hill, where the town would manifest itself in a specific way designed to maximize guilt and pain for the protagonist. In Silent Hill 2, our character also can't exactly understand 
understand why he is in the town, but he gradually suffers more and more as he remembers. In Strange Land, our hero appears to be in a hell designed to torture him, but due to his inability to remember, he is neither scared nor tortured. Yes, he does feel that he has to save that woman, but his general emotional state is calm and collected. And when you think about it, that makes perfect sense, since he remembers nothing from before the moment he woke up in this place. Since the world of Strangeland is all he has ever known, it's no surprise that he will accept it, because that is what normality looks to him. As the player, we can't really feel any empathy towards him either because again, he's not really suffering. I did mention how you have to die multiple times, some of which on purpose. He neither fears these moments nor expresses any reservations towards dying. When he resurrects, he just goes about his business again. I find it confusing that a game with such dark undertones, almost a complete lack of humor and so much death manages to fail at making its characters suffer. It doesn't help that the NPCs keep telling you that this isn't the first time you have appeared there all confused. This indicates that the nightmare repeats itself, but even that has no effect on the protagonist because he simply cannot suffer over something he doesn't remember and has no scars from. Let me give you an example. If you found out that you had a horrible accident in another life and died after suffering for months, would you suffer over it now? The answer is no, you wouldn't because you neither remember it nor do you have any remaining damages from that other life. It's the same here. The character just goes about his business. It's all new to him every time. Another problem arises from the fact that the game is all about metaphors. Whenever the stranger talks to someone, expect them to answer in what sounds like a riddle. At first, it was interesting, but after 30 minutes, I was beginning to get annoyed. It doesn't help that there are constant references to Nordic, Greek and Christian mythology. Personally, I can't stand hearing about Nordic myth anymore. It's like there's nothing else lately. Everything is Vikings, Valhalla, Valkyries, Thor, etc. There are so many interesting stories from various cultures and yet here we are talking about the same ones over and over again. Obviously people like it, but I personally cannot stand it anymore. And while the endless metaphors annoyed me to no end, the biggest issue arises from the fact that the story is constantly constantly giving you subtle hints about the narrative but somehow still manages to be cryptic enough to fly over most players heads. I've spoken to a few other people who played the game and they agreed with me on this. On my first playthrough, I didn't quite get what is going on until the very end. My assumption was that this is intended but I actually decided to play the game a second time around, this time with annotations and developer commentary turned on and came to realize that the game was constantly giving me hints and I mean a lot of them. So ultimately I see two problems here. One, I am stupid. Two, the game assumes that I'm smart. I know what you are thinking. Sounds like a you problem, Nino. And yes, you are correct, at least partially. But the fact of the matter is, there are others like me. Out of the five people I asked, four had the same experience as I did. Three of them never played the game a second time. That means out of six people in total, when you include me, one managed to get the hints during their first playthrough, two people got them during the second one, where everything is spelled out to them, I'm one of those people, and three people never got him because they never played the game a second time. That's 50% of our test sample. Half of the players never really understood the game. These numbers point towards bad story design. You have to make sure that your players will understand the story and recognize its hints. Otherwise, what's the point of putting them in there? Obviously, I will not spoil anything here, so I can't really make any suggestions on how to make this better, but I can't say as much. The writer should have talked to more testers. At one point during the developer commentary, you can actually hear the writer say that to him, the hints felt really obvious. But then again, he placed him there, so of course it will seem very clear to him. He knows what he's hinting towards, so of course the hints will be extremely obvious. But for people like me, they were not, at least not the first time around. And this is a big problem as well, since the game really doesn't offer anything in order to warrant a second playthrough. I only did it because I wanted to check if the dev commentary and annotations are worth it, and above all, since I knew that I could complete the game in under two hours, now that I knew the solutions to all the puzzles. And speaking of puzzles, let's move on to them. Here, I can't really complain, I found them to be easy enough to figure out, 
default and while many of them were illogical, that actually fits the particular setting so it didn't disturb me. And whenever I got stuck, the hint system I mentioned earlier would provide assistance while also being original and entertaining. In the end I enjoyed Strangeland because it's one of those rare types of games which tick the right boxes for me even if it doesn't do a good job at it. The game is really short, there's no character development, the story is overflowing with pompous metaphors and is not designed to be understood by the average player. It felt like the author is trying to show off how intelligent he is and how much he has read about things that 99% of people didn't even know existed. Once you activate the annotations and realize where most of the quotes come from, you sit there wondering who this game was even made for. I find it particularly annoying that a second playthrough, which comes after you have seen the ending, is much easier to digest and makes so much more sense, but sadly offers no other advantage than being able to make a few more achievements. With such a short game, they could have implemented some sort of new game plus mode, perhaps where the character has a few more voice lines and is now more aware of what is happening. I know it's a small development team and this tiny game took them forever to make, but unfortunately its short duration leads to multiple serious problems. With that having been said, I still think it's worth playing it. Just be prepared to invest the extra 2 hours for a second playthrough with the dev commentary and annotations turned on. The story makes so much more sense and while there is still a total lack of character development leading to the player mostly not being able to connect with the protagonist, it's still quite interesting to recognize all the hints the game throws at you which then leads to a more enjoyable experience. If you do decide to try the game, I suggest getting it on GOG.com. I'm not affiliated with them in any way, I simply recommend that platform because it's the only one dedicated to providing DRM free games. Anything you purchase there, you can download and install at home without the need of any launchers or other additional bloatware on your PC, just as it was in the good old days. Besides, the game is currently 10% cheaper there than it is on Steam. With that having been said, I would also like to remind you to check out my Patreon account from time to time where I publish links to all the good free games I find. You'll find the link in the description of this video. Thank you for watching GameFilter. I hope to see you on the next one. Until then, have a great day.